the story that Karen just shared with us makes one thing crystal clear. There is incredible power in an invitation. Just one invitation can make someone's day or even change someone's life. And maybe you already know this, uh, and you can think of a time in your own life when somebody extended an invitation to you. And maybe they just invited you for coffee, or they invited you to go out, or they invited you to apply for a job. Maybe they invited you on a date, or they invited you to church. And, and that invitation, it ultimately changed the course of your whole life. We're in the middle of a teaching series here at Trinity. It's called All In. And it's part of our spring stewardship campaign. Yes, every year here at Trinity, we spend some time talking about money and we're not ashamed about that. We think it's actually really important to talk about money because money is a very big part of our lives. And uh, this year, we're asking you to be all in for Trinity Streetsville. And by in, uh, on the one hand, we mean invested in Trinity Streetsville, being someone who generously gives financially and supports this church in our work of ministry. Uh, but related to this is another in word. And uh, today I want to say that we're not just talking about being invested, but about being invited. An inviting church, a warm, welcoming place where we open our doors to friends and neighbors. Um, but you might be saying, what do these two things have to do with each other? Uh, and other than the fact that they both start with in, what does investing have to do with inviting? Uh, what does how I use my money have to do about uh, being a welcoming church? Or, or put it this way, what does opening my wallet have to do with opening the doors of this place to invite others? It's a great question. And the answer to these two themes, both welcoming others and financial generosity, uh, the answer is that these are so intimately connected that they keep showing up again and again in the teaching of Jesus himself. Jesus understood that the way we use our money has a huge impact on how people find their way into God's family, how they find their way through those doors to the kingdom, to the church. Uh, generosity and hospitality, therefore, they go together. Investing and inviting, they go together. And I want to show you how. Now, there is this amazing story in Luke's gospel in chapter 14. And I invite you to open up your Bible or turn on your Bible as we look at it together. And what we're going to see is that Jesus himself got invited. Uh, he was invited to someone's house. He was invited to a dinner banquet. And when he got there, he saw all these shenanigans going on. And, and he decided to use the opportunity to challenge people to rethink both how they invite and how they invest. How they both practice generosity and how they practice hospitality. But first, you need to know something about banquets in Jesus' day. These were not just, you know, your friendly run-of-the-mill block parties where everyone just hung out and had fun. No, these dinner banquets were all about competing and connecting and schmoozing and networking. When you went to these dinners, you were, you're not going to, to have a, a laugh and have a good time. You were going because you wanted to increase your honor, you wanted to increase your status, you wanted to increase your reputation within the community. Even more, these banquets were ultimately about increasing your wealth, increasing your business, increasing your bank account. For example, hosting a banquet was primarily an opportunity for the host to try to gain honor and social standing with others by serving really good food and really good wine, by having really comfortable cushions and decor and ambience. This was a big opportunity for the host to make themselves look good, a real chance to impress their peers and actually put his guests in his debt. If you did a great job hosting, your stock went up, your honor went up, your opportunities went up. Uh, but it wasn't just the host who was competing at these things, so were the guests. See, as a guest in attendance, you also saw this dinner party as a chance to gain honor or lose honor. You know, where will I be seated? Will I be close to the host or far away? What clothes will I wear? What am I gonna talk about? Will I make an impression or not? You know, depending on how these things go for you at the dinner, your honor, your status, your wealth can go up or down in the long run. So this isn't just a party. This is a playing field, uh, and there's lots at stake here. In the Greco-Roman world, they operated on what was called the patronage system. And that meant if you ever wanted to move up in life, you had to have some friends in high places. You need to know some prominent people. If you had wealthy and powerful patrons or friends who could give you loans or gifts or maybe open doors for you, you were set. If you could make friends with the right person, then it would be good for business, good for your future, good for your bottom line. 
And as for those patrons, those wealthy people, right, the more people they had connected to them meant the more that they could get done, right? They could get breaks on their business deals and, and they could get favors from people who were indebted to them. So, so when you had these suppers, that's what's going on. People were trying to meet each other. They're trying to connect. They're trying to, like I say, schmooze. They're, they're trying to sustain business relationships. They're trying to make new profitable relationships as they try to move up that socioeconomic ladder. Therefore, it was really, really important who you invited to these parties. You needed to invite your rich neighbors and you needed to invite people who were at least on the same economic level as you or higher. And if you were throwing one of these parties, it was going to cost you a lot of dough. It was extremely expensive, but you weren't worried because you knew that if it went well, it would all pay for itself in the end through the connections and the honors and the favors and the status and the business deals and the arrangements, and you get the idea. And so therefore, if you were throwing one of these parties, it would make no sense to invite people of a lower social class. I mean, what was the point of that? They couldn't repay you. They couldn't open any doors for you. They couldn't help you climb the ladder, the social ladder, and being around them certainly wouldn't help increase your honor. So now you begin to see the connection between inviting and investing, right? The people you surround yourself with and the financial implications go hand in hand. There is a connection between the parties you have in your date book and the dollars that you have in your pocketbook. These dinners were investments. They were investments for personal gain. And that's important to know because Jesus is about to mess with that whole system. Look at what Jesus does. He, he walks into one of these dinners and he's looking around and he's watching the people jockey for position. He's seeing all these power plays taking place. And, and Jesus says to the host, to the patron, he says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So there you go. Wow, a classic Jesus mic drop. Jesus, what did he just say? He said, well, well, it's important to note what he didn't say first. He didn't say you can't hang out with your friends, and he didn't say you can't get together with your family or your relatives. That's not what he's saying. And I don't think Jesus is even saying here that you can't have a business dinner or, or get a deal done over a meal. No, but what Jesus is talking about is priorities. Where is your priority? Is your priority focused on maintaining your place in society and your standing or your wealth? Or is your priority on those who lack wealth and standing? The poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Is your priority on those you're comfortable being around, those who are like you, those whose friendships kind of benefit you? Or is your priority on those outsiders, outcasts, even if those people make you feel uncomfortable? And so now you can see how this starts to boil down to money. Jesus is saying that you're giving to charity and mission and ministry. That is, you know, how you give to people's physical needs and how you give to their spiritual needs. This kind of giving should be the priority in our lives. And that means we should be investing there more than we invest in our own personal position and comfort, which is what these suppers were all about. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't spend money on yourself, but that the money that you give to support ministry and charity and outreach and mission and pastoral care and worship, that this should be the priority. And this should probably be more. Now, when Jesus said this, and when we hear Jesus say this now, it makes us feel disturbed and conflicted. I feel disturbed and conflicted by it because it means we have to make decisions and we have to make sacrifices with our money, right? Uh, we, we're, we like those people at the bank. We're, we're, we have goals too. We have places we'd like to go. We have things we'd like to do and stuff we'd like to buy. But, but if I invest my money with the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, then I won't have enough to do all those other things, right? In other words, it's going to cost me. I won't be able to do all those things and enjoy all those comforts if I open my doors to others. There just won't be enough for both. And that's the truth. Giving generously always requires sacrifice. And most people are not prepared to make that sacrifice. Even these people in the story that we read, they were spending a lot of money hosting that meal but it wasn't really a sacrifice because they knew they were going to get their money back in other ways. 
but throwing a feast and inviting the poor, where is the payback there? It is so natural for all of us to want to look after our own needs first, and then if we have anything left, we can give that to God and we can give that to the poor. But Jesus is saying, what if you switch that around? What if you gave first to ministry, first to charity, before you spent any of it on yourself? What if you looked after the security of others before you looked after your own security? And what if you opened your doors to those in need before you held parties to benefit yourself? What would that look like? Well, in the Old Testament, the way they did it with this kind of giving was the tithe. Tithe was just a word. It means 10, 10%. In the Old Testament, people would give a tenth, the first tenth of their income to the tabernacle, to the poor, to the ministry, to charity. That was like the baseline, the starting point. Uh, it's interesting, though, in the New Testament, Jesus often expanded on this idea. He encouraged his disciples to be more generous than that. In fact, Paul, in one of his letters, commends a church because they gave as much as they were able and beyond their abilities. Now, this is the kind of church that Jesus is trying to create, a radically generous church, but also a radically inviting church, a welcoming church. And that's where Jesus goes next. Uh, Jesus ends uh, by telling a story to show what it would look like to see this kind of generosity put into practice. A certain man, he says, was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who have been invited, come for everything is now ready. So just stop there. Here we have the exact picture of what we're talking about. This man is ready to invite his rich neighbors. He wants to gain status. He wants to do some deals. Hopefully his guests will reciprocate and he's going to benefit personally from the whole affair. But then something interesting happens. Excuses start to fly in as to why his guests can't make it. Now, Gordon King, who wrote a great book on Jesus' parables, says that you know what's happening here. He says, these people, in, in all their clamor to, to get status and honor, uh, these invitees have all conspired together as a group to reject the invitation, to bring shame and to humiliate the host. Now, I don't know what he did. Was the host a threat? Did he double-cross someone? Whatever it was, there was only so much honor to go around, there's only so much status, so much money to go around, and this dog-eat-dog -dog world that they lived in, it looked like he'd been sabotaged. And so they all start making excuses. They're going to embarrass him. The first one says, oh, I just bought a field. I got to go see it. But please, no one would go buy a field uh, until they had looked at it first. Uh, another says, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. But again, the same thing. No one buys oxen without testing them out first. It's still another one says, uh, I just got married, so I can't come. Uh, and that's probably just a slap in the face, a backhanded way of saying, oh, I'd rather spend my night at home than at your place. So what's he going to do, right? They're all trying to ruin him. And then he has his wake-up call. When the host realizes what's going on, that he's been betrayed, you know, he just decides, you know what? I don't want to live this way anymore. And he makes a bold decision. He says, I'm not going to play this game anymore. I'm not going to compete for honor and for prestige and wealth. Instead, I'm putting God's kingdom first. And so he sends out the same invitation, but this time to the poor, to the crippled, to the blind, and the lame instead. So do you see what's happened, right? His inviting and his investing have now lined up with God's kingdom. It's no longer about his own wealth or his own goals or his own agenda. It's now about God's priorities, God's kingdom goals, God's agenda. His heart has changed. His priorities have changed. He is now a follower of Jesus, and his wealth now will, will go to serve others. And now his home is going to be open to all people. And of course, in the process, he's ruined his reputation, right? His old friends are going to laugh at him. His honor in the community will probably be diminished, and he will no longer have friends in high places. Uh, but he seems to think that's okay, right? He says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited are going to get a taste of my banquet. He has a new priority. He's got a new generosity. And you know what? He's also got some new friends in the process. He has a new community. It came at a cost, but the cost was worth it. Jesus says, although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When we pour ourselves out for other people, when we care for people, when we go the extra mile for people, when we give our money away, we might feel like we're missing out. We're going to miss out on that next trip or the next vacation or the next car or the next iPhone or whatever, but you're not. You're not missing out on anything, Jesus says, because of the resurrection. You're not missing out at all. 
Jesus says, you are just sacrificing present wealth, yes, but you're going to be repaid with future wealth in the resurrection. Can you imagine what it would be like if we here at Trinity were that kind of church? A church that just poured our resources out for others. A church that opened up our doors uh, to others. A church that just prioritized God's kingdom over our own comforts. A church where everyone felt invited and everyone felt welcomed. I tell you, you couldn't keep people away from a church like that. In fact, did you notice that in this story, when the host sent out his servant to the poor who lived in the streets and in the hedges to invite them, he had to compel them. He had to argue with them. He had to convince them to come into my banquet. Come on in, come in. They wouldn't believe him. Why? They couldn't believe it. Who would believe it? This kind of generosity was unheard of. And you know, I think that's the same thing that people would say about a church today if we lived like that. If they experienced this kind of welcome, this kind of invitation, if they saw us with this kind of generosity and they experienced this kind of love, they would look at us and they would say, like, I don't believe it, right? We've never seen anything like that. It seems too good to be true, but it is true. It's true of the gospel and it can be true of us at Trinity because the gospel says Jesus gave his life. Jesus sacrificed everything. He paid it all in order to prepare a feast for us. We don't have to bring anything. It isn't a potluck dinner. Right? Everything's been prepared. Everything's been paid for. We only need to accept Jesus' invitation. And when we realize just how Jesus surrendered his status and his wealth and his life for us in order that we might come into his house, then we will start to do the same thing. We will start giving sacrificially. We will start inviting liberally. We will start investing generously in what God is doing here at Trinity and in his wider kingdom throughout the world. So thanks be to God. Amen.